Imagine living on an island where dawn breaks in silence. Decades ago, Guam's skies were alive with birdsong. Then, in one of history's strangest rescue missions, scientists dropped thousands of mice laced with poison from helicopters, desperate to stop an invasion that hid inside US military cargo after World War II. The intruders? Brown tree snakes, toppling ecosystems and erasing wildlife, even blacking out power for days. What really happened after the parachuting mice hit the jungle, and did this last-ditch gamble save Guam or only buy time? To understand why dropping poisoned mice became the island's final hope, we have to start with the moment Guam's paradise fell silent. The brown tree snake wasn't always part of Guam's story. Its journey began thousands of miles away, in the tangled forests of northern Australia and Papua New Guinea. After World War II, the US military moved tons of cargo across the Pacific, with Guam serving as a key base. Ships and planes carried everything from vehicles to crates of supplies. Inside those shipments, hidden in the dark, a few snakes found passage. Genetic studies now trace Guam's entire brown tree snake population back to the Admiralty Islands near Papua New Guinea, matching the main shipping routes of the late 1940s. At the time, no one on Guam was watching for stowaway reptiles. Quarantine checks were minimal, and the idea of a snake invasion seemed impossible. Brown tree bee snakes are masters of stealth, nocturnal, able to survive for weeks without food or water, and small enough to slip into tight spaces. They could coil up inside crates or even the landing gear of aircraft, traveling undetected. By the time the first reliable reports surfaced in the early 1950s, the snakes had already spread quietly across the island. There were no natural predators waiting for them on Guam. The island's forests had never hosted anything like the brown tree snake, so nothing stood in the way of their survival. Early sightings were often ignored or mistaken for native species. There wasn't a single record of these snakes on Guam before the war. But within a few years, field notes and museum collections began to fill with their specimens. The evidence grew. The snakes were here to stay. Military shipping logs from that era, if they still exist, might show how often cargo moved between Melanesia and Guam. What's clear is that inspection protocols weren't designed to stop reptiles. The snakes arrived, settled in, and began to multiply. The island's ecological balance had been upended, but almost no one realized it yet. The stage was set for an explosion one that would transform Guam's forests, culture, and economy in the decades ahead. Before the brown tree snake arrived, Guam's forests were anything but quiet. Chamorro elders remember waking to a dawn chorus so thick with song it was impossible to count the voices. Names like Coco for the Guam rail, Totot for the Mariana fruit dove, and Sihek for the kingfisher weren't just words. They were woven into stories, lullabies, and everyday lessons. Birdsong marked the start of the day, the changing of seasons, and the timing of harvests. For many, the soundscape of the forest was a kind of living calendar, guiding everything from fishing to planting. The silence that followed the snake's arrival landed harder than most outsiders could imagine. In family homes, parents stopped teaching children bird calls because there was nothing left to hear. Grandparents told stories about birds that the youngest generation would never see. Ceremonies and Kantan Komoro chants, once rich with references to forest birds, began to lose their meaning. Place names like Tapia Totol, once known for dove nesting, became reminders of what was missing. Even woven mats and ornaments, once decorated with feathers, shifted to other materials. The absence was everywhere, but it was felt most in the little things. No more spotting a flash of colour in the canopy. No more pausing to listen as the forest came alive at sunrise. For some, the loss was personal. One elder described it simply. It's like the forest forgot how to sing. The quiet changed the way families related to the land. Walks in the jungle became exercises in memory, not discovery. Children grew up without the animal stories that had guided their parents and grandparents. The rhythm of daily life, once tied to the calls of the cocoa or the fruit dove, shifted to something more abstract, less rooted in nature. Community leaders and teachers tried to keep memories alive. 
School lessons started to include stories about birds that no longer existed. Museums displayed feathered artifacts and played old recordings of Cantan Chamorro, hoping to spark curiosity. But for many, the silence was a wound that could not be healed by stories alone. The loss of the birds wasn't just an ecological event. It cut through the heart of Chamorro identity, leaving a generation adrift between memory and silence. By the late 1970s, Guam's forests weren't just quiet, they were hollowed out. Scientists from the University of Guam started counting what was left. The numbers told a grim story. In some areas, 12 native bird species were gone. The Mariana fruit dove, the Guam flycatcher, and the Micronesian rufous fantail had vanished. Surveys found that in certain forests, the only bird calls were echoes from species introduced by people. But the damage didn't stop with birds. Power company managers began logging a new kind of emergency. Brown tree snakes drawn to the warmth of transformers and the shelter of power lines caused nearly 200 outages every year by the early 80s. Hospitals lost electricity, businesses shut down, the military scrambled to keep radar and communications running. Each blackout cost thousands of dollars. Annual losses climbed past $4 million, and the outages became so routine that some neighborhoods kept flashlights by the door. For local officials, the crisis was no longer just about missing birds. It was about keeping the lights on, protecting the economy, and stopping the next disaster before it struck. The scale of the problem made it clear. Piecemeal fixes wouldn't be enough. Something bigger had to change. Traps seemed like the obvious answer at first. Teams of field technicians built thousands of them. Wooden boxes baited with live mice checked and reset every day. The traps worked, but only in small patches near villages or along roads. For every snake caught, dozens more slipped through the canopy, laying eggs in hidden places. It was like trying to empty a lake with a coffee cup. Engineers tried another approach, fencing. They designed electric barriers these to keep snakes out of power stations and warehouses. Some fences even delivered a mild shock to any snake that tried to climb. These barriers protected a few key sites, but the cost to ring the entire island would have been astronomical. Maintenance was a constant battle against rust, storms, and the snake's knack for finding weak spots. Detector dogs added another layer of defense, especially at airports and shipping docks. Their noses could pick out a single snake in a shipment of cargo, stopping new invasions before they started. But dogs couldn't help with the thousands already loose in the forests. Night hunting teams combed the jungle with flashlights, pulling snakes from tree branches by hand. They caught hundreds, sometimes thousands, but the population kept bouncing back. Every method chipped away at the problem, but none could keep pace with a species that could lay a dozen eggs at a time. The limits of conventional tactics were becoming painfully clear. Something more drastic was needed. With every traditional method falling short, the search for new solutions took a turn toward the unconventional. Policy advisors and scientists debated ideas that at first glance sounded more like science fiction than conservation. There were bounties offered for every snake brought in, but the payouts never matched the sheer number of snakes hiding in the trees. Night hunting teams ramped up their patrols, combing the jungle with headlamps and long poles, yet for every snake caught, dozens more slipped through the branches. The numbers just didn't add up. Some experts pushed for biological control, hoping to import new predators to tip the balance. The risks, though, were hard to ignore. Stories from other islands made the rounds, like the mongoose brought to Hawaii, which ended up wiping out native birds instead of rats. Guam's leaders weren't eager to trade one invasive disaster for another. Proposals for spreading snake-specific diseases were aired but no one could guarantee they'd stay contained or spare other reptiles. Engineers and biologists tried everything from pheromone traps to ultrasonic repellents, but nothing worked at the scale needed. Each experiment ended in disappointment or unintended consequences. By the late 1980s, the sense of frustration was palpable. The island was stuck at a crossroads, with no clear way forward and the problem only growing worse. The answer came from the lab in the form of a simple white pill. 
Acetaminophen, the same painkiller found in Tylenol, turned out to be deadly for brown tree snakes. Just 80 milligrams, about what you'd find in a children's tablet, was enough to kill a full-grown snake. Researchers confirmed this weakness through dozens of controlled trials. The drug caused a kind of internal suffocation, blocking the snake's blood from carrying oxygen. Within hours, the snake stopped moving. The effect was consistent, and it spared most other animals on Guam thanks to differences in metabolism. But knowing the right poison was only half the battle. The real challenge was getting it to the snakes, and only the snakes. Brown tree snakes spend their nights hunting in the canopy. Standard ground bait would miss most of them entirely. That's where the engineers stepped in. They needed a delivery system that could reach the treetops, stay out of reach of other animals, and disappear without a trace when the job was done. The solution was as odd as it was effective. Dead mice, each injected with exactly 80 milligrams of acetaminophen, attached to tiny biodegradable parachutes. The design wasn't accidental. The cardboard was cut in a cross shape, light enough to drift down and catch on branches, but sturdy enough to hold the mouse at just the right height, usually between three and six feet above the ground. Early prototypes tangled or fell straight through. Each failure led to tweaks, a different cut, a new fold, a change in weight. Engineers ran the drop after drop, measuring where the baits landed and how long they lasted in the humid island air. Only when the system could reliably catch in the canopy, break down in a week or two and cost just a few dollars per unit was it ready for action. What started as a chemistry problem had become an engineering puzzle. The answer would soon fall from the sky. In 2013, helicopters traced tight grid patterns over Anderson Air Force Base releasing thousands of dead mice, each fitted with the small cardboard parachute. The mice, packed with an 80 milligram dose of acetaminophen, floated down into the forest canopy, right where brown tree snakes hunted at night. On the ground, biologists and technicians watched for results. Within weeks, motion-triggered cameras and nighttime surveys showed a sharp drop in snake sightings across the treated area. The operation, led by the USDA and Department of Defense, had achieved what years of traps and fences could not, a measurable decline in a population that once seemed unstoppable. But the spectacle of poisoned mice raining from the sky drew immediate attention beyond Guam. Animal welfare groups and environmental advocates raised urgent questions. Was it right to kill thousands of snakes in this way? What if the poison reached other animals? Scientists responded with data. Necropsy reports revealed that almost no non-target species touched the baits. The parachutes, designed to snag in branches three to six feet above the ground, kept the mice out of reach for most mammals and birds. Acetaminophen, deadly to snakes but harmless at these doses to other wildlife, broke down quickly in the tropical heat. Still, the debate was far from settled. Some argued that mass poisoning, even if targeted, was a short-term fix a bandage over a deeper wound. Others worried about the precedent. If one crisis justified such measures, what stopped future projects from pushing the ethical line further? Inside federal agencies, ethicists and project leads weighed the costs and benefits in late-night meetings. One internal memo put it plainly, we faced a choice between bad and catastrophic. The operation's early success proved the method could work, but the question of what should be done lingered long after the last parachute dissolved into the forest floor. Schoolyards across Guam now echo with a new kind of lesson. Children learn to spot brown tree snakes, check backyard traps, and share stories about birds their grandparents once knew. Science fairs feature projects on native species, and classrooms celebrate the return of the coco, the Guam rail, once thought lost forever. Local families volunteer for weekend patrols, walking the boundaries of fenced sanctuaries to make sure no snake has slipped inside. Some parents bring their children to these protected patches of forest, pointing out the flash of a reintroduced kingfisher or listening for the faint call of a fruit dove. Conservation staff, many of them born and raised on the island, lead workshops and field trips, teaching both old traditions and new science. In Twenneetum, the first wild nesting of the Guam rail in over 30 years was recorded. 
a small event, but for many, a sign that hope is more than a word. The work is steady, never finished, but every new bird call is a reminder of what's possible when a community decides not to give up. Islands around the world have watched Guam's battle and taken notes. In Hawaii, a single brown tree snake discovered in a Christmas tree shipment at the airport in 2004 nearly changed the course of the state's history. Detector dogs and sharp-eyed biosecurity teams caught it just in time. Had that snake slipped through, Hawaii's native birds, already under pressure, could have faced the same fate as Guam's. The stakes are so high that Hawaii spends millions every year on cargo inspections, detector dogs, and extra screening at military bases, all to stop just one snake from getting loose. Elsewhere, entire islands have tried their own large-scale solutions. In 2001, helicopters dropped poison bait across Campbell Island in New Zealand, wiping out more than 200,000 rats in a single campaign. The payoff was immediate. Seabird colonies returned, and native plants began to recover. On Pinzon Island in the Galapagos, a similar operation in 2012 led to the first natural tortoise hatchlings in over a century. Each of these projects borrowed lessons from the last, tailoring methods to local terrain, wildlife, and risk. Now, new tools are on the horizon. Drones deliver bait with pinpoint accuracy to remote cliffs and dense forests, places helicopters can't reach. In labs, researchers are testing gene drives to control pests by tweaking their ability to reproduce, though no open field trials have begun. Every advance comes with new questions, but the trend is clear. Prevention and innovation go hand in hand. Guam's experience has become a blueprint for islands everywhere, showing that even the toughest invasions can be managed with the right mix of science, vigilance and creativity. In 2013, helicopters released more than 2,000 poisoned mice over Anderson Air Force Base, a method that reduced brown tree snake numbers by up to 90% in targeted zones, as confirmed by federal monitoring reports. This campaign followed decades of failed trapping, fencing and night hunts that could not contain an estimated 30,000 snakes per square mile at the infestation's peak. While the acetaminophen bait proved highly effective in specific areas, documents show it must be repeated regularly and cannot fully eradicate the snake. The long-term effects on Guam's remaining native wildlife are still under study, and not all operational data from the military-controlled zones is public. Today, the Guam Rail has been reintroduced to fenced sanctuaries and intercepted cargo in Hawaii, highlights how one missed snake could start the cycle again. The Guam case stands as evidence that prevention is far easier than restoration, and that even the most creative solutions have limits when fighting invasive species. <laughs>